I again. In Kenneth Scott Latrette's Christianity Takes Shape in Organizational and Doctrine, that is in his book, A History of Christianity, he takes up the Montanist movement, a movement quite distinct from both the Gnostics and the Marcionites, but which had wide vogue in the latter part of the second century and persisted for more than two centuries and which brought division in the church, took its name from Montanus of Phrygia in Asia Minor, who flourished in the second half of the second century. Because of the region of their origin, the Montanists were often referred to as Phrygians. They represented a revival of the prophets who were prominent in the first few decades of the church, a call to Christians to stricter living, and a vivid belief in the early end of the world, in the second coming of Christ, and in the establishment of the ideal society in the New Jerusalem. At his baptism, Montanus spoke with tongues and began prophesying, declaring that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, promised in the gospel according to John, was finding utterance through him. Two women, his disciples, were also believed to be prophets, mouthpieces of the Holy Spirit. The three taught that the Spirit had revealed to them the early end of the world, and that the New Jerusalem would come down out of heaven from God, as has been foretold in the gospel, in the Revelation of John, and that it would be fixed in Phrygia. The belief in the early second coming of Christ was not new, nor was it exclusively a tenet of the Montanists. Ground for it was found in more than one of the Gospels and New Testament epistles and in the Revelation of John. Many held to the view that before the final end of history and the full accomplishment of God's purpose in the perfect doing of his will, a hope which was common to all Christians, Christ would return, set up his kingdom on earth, and reign for a thousand years. The center of, his, of this kingdom was often placed at Jerusalem. The return of Christ was associated with the resurrection and the last judgment. The conception of an age or ages of a thousand years duration was not confined to Christians, but was also to be found in Judaism. Nor did all Christians who held this, this view agree upon the order of the events connected with the thousand year reign of Christ. The expectations associated with the millennial reign of Christ are technically known as Chiliasm or Chiliasm. Not far from the time of Montanus, at least two bishops, one in Pontus, one in Syria, were expecting the early return of Christ. The one declared that the last judgment would come in two years, and those who believed him ceased to cultivate their fields and rid themselves of houses and goods. The other led his flock into the wilderness to meet Christ. Since the return of Christ and the last judgment were regarded as being so imminent, believers were urged to be strict in their living. Celibacy was encouraged, fasting was enjoined, and martyrdom was held in high honor. The Montanist movement spread widely. It was especially popular in Asia Minor, and persisted there and in Carthage into the 5th century. It was found in the other sections of the Mediterranean world, including Rome, Gaul, and North Africa. It had itinerant preachers supported by the gifts of the faithful, and in time seems to have been fairly well organized, with a head living in Phrygia. It prized the records of the teachings of Christ and his apostles, but it believed, although not contradicting what had been said there, that the Holy Spirit continued to speak through prophets, and among these it included women. It stressed a high standard of Christian living among Christian communities, into which laxity was beginning to creep. The most eminent convert to Montanism was Tertullian, born in Carthage, not far from the middle of the second century, of wealthy pagan parents. He was widely read in philosophy and history, knew Greek well, and practiced law in Rome. In early middle life he was converted and became a presbyter. Much of the remainder of his life he spent in his native city. There he wrote voluminously and was the first to employ Latin extensively on Christian subjects. Possibly because of the caste which his legal training had given to his mind, Tertullian's literary style was systematic, precise, and vigorously polemical. Pronouncedly orthodox, he com composed an extensive treatise against Marcion. Early in the, in the third century, in late middle life, he became a Montanist and remained critical of the majority church until his death towards the close of the first quarter 
of the century. So Tertullian's very famous figure, of course, much quoted in Watchtower literature when discussing the early church's failures. But, of course, he was orthodox, and his orthodoxy led him into this extremely, shall we say, separatist and legalist section of Christianity, the Montanist movement. You, you cannot fail to see the parallels with much, not just the cults, in their, in their stresses upon separation and uh, a higher standard of, of stri or strictness in living, but also with, of course, several branches of the Christian church. The, the holiness movement of the last 130 years is a good example. Next time, the development and clarification of Catholic organization and doctrine by competition. I'll put in a link to what Justin Martyr, who was uh, thriving in the middle of the second century, what did Justin Martyr in his apologies regard as the orthodox eschatology? What was the place of Jerusalem in the millennial expectation of Justin Martyr and what he considered to the, be the majority of opinion among the orthodox as to eschatology.